Dr. Lindsay is the Executive Director of the Schreier Institute for Teaching Excellence and the Associate Dean for Teaching in the Office of Undergraduate Education at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Lindsay has a PhD in Anthropology and is a specialist in enhancing teaching and learning through faculty and instructional development. She has an extensive record of teaching and professional developments in university teaching centers. She has written and presented widely on enhancing teaching and learning, diversity and inclusive teaching, program assessment, student ratings, and strategic planning. She is also involved in the professional development of teaching center directors, and she is the one who made you had note cards, so get ready to learn. Thank you for clustering. Um, I am gonna have you talk to each other. I'm gonna say a few words first, but um, thank you, uh, Dr. Keenan, and um, Dr. Gottgold, who invited me um, to participate in this event. I heard that this is the fourth year that this has been going on. That is so awesome. And that you're all here before classes start to think about yourselves as leaders and moving up is just absolutely impressive. So, um, Women in the Academy has been a really important topic for me for many, many years. Um, I, I got my graduate degree in archaeology, a subfield of anthropology, which is still very male dominated, despite that we also get out there in, in the dirt um, with them. Uh, it's sort of a weird thing that there's more women in graduate school than there are women out in the professional world, whether in academia or contract archaeology. So, so that's always been sort of um, part of my education is thinking about women um, and uh, le women's leadership. But it was not until I fin was just finishing my doctorate finally um, that I, I, and I had to make this choice about whether I was gonna go into the faculty career, which is what most graduate students are trained to do, right? Um, per, not, not all, some disciplines are much more professional track, but um, certainly in the social sciences, that's where we tend to go. Um, but I had, as a, a senior graduate student, or an old graduate student, um, <coughs> had um, learned about what it was like to work in a teaching center at the University of Washington. And um, I found myself talking about a faculty career a little sort of like this, and talking about a faculty development career like this, so that helped me make that decision. Um, and I think it was the right choice, and you can read my chapter if you're interested in finding out why. Um, but as my first step along the faculty development, also called instructional development or academic development, and I'll probably interchange those if I say them again. Um, but on that faculty development career trajectory, I worked in a college of engineering, archaeology, engineering. It actually worked. Um, so I was working in an engineering education teaching and research center founded by the first female College of Engineering Dean in a big research university. Very, very rare. And so women in engineering then I started getting very interested in. So that's a track that has stayed with me, this interest of women in leadership and women in the academy, ever since I sort of started in those two places and that interest has converged um, all along the career. So. When um, Dr. Guckold asked me to co-author, and I must say, working with her was a breeze because she is an amazing, she works constantly and is thinking constantly. <coughs> um, so my, my job was kind of easy, actually. <laughs> she knows everybody and picked great uh, folks. I did make some contributions. Um, but, uh, so then having that opportunity to really pull this together was so exciting. And I get goosebumps when I read the chapters in the book because partly uh, um, of what Nikki said, that they're so personal. 
Um, and even those that are not as personal, they are biographical. And I think that really has been a powerful um, part of this book, just learning some of the issues that folks faced, as well as the successes that they had. It was a great opportunity to acknowledge the successes that we've had. So, one of the things that has occurred to me as I've been involved in this um, interest and area of women in the academy for a long time is that the academy is actually one of the few places in our society where women's brains are actually celebrated. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm surrounded by brilliant women, all right? I mean, there is the highest concentration of smart women in the academy, and we're allowed to be smart. Okay, so there are some barriers, but think about this. We are celebrated for being smart, for being good problem solvers, and eventually for being leaders. So, that's sort of the end of my remarks. But So the thing I wanna do with you today, why you got the index cards, um, and we're, I had to adapt, because I wasn't expecting this room, but that's okay. That's what we do, right? We adapt. Um, what I want you to do is hang with me. I don't have slides to tell you what all the steps are, but I'm gonna stop at each point and give you another task, all right? So we have a couple of tasks. The reason we're doing an activity is because I've done a ton of professional development activities myself, learning to be a better leader, learning to be a better practitioner, and I wanted to do something that might hopefully be useful for you. I don't know how many of you have gone to talks and you've gone away and you thought, now what? <laughs> All right, so that's what we're doing today. So we're gonna hear our own voices. All right, so I am gonna ask some of you to talk. I'm gonna ask you to talk to each other and I'm gonna ask for volunteers afterwards. But most importantly, I want something to be useful to you. So, I want you to take first step. Take one minute and think about some women or a particular woman that you admire for her leadership abilities. This could be a woman you know, or women you know, or women you just <coughs> know from afar. It can be a peer leader. Women lead from all different places, as we all know. We can lead from the side as a peer, we can lead from the margins, and we can even lead from behind or below. We've all seen it. So, who pops into your mind? Write their name down. I'm gonna give you one minute, and I don't have a watch. <laughs> okay. And I really mean one minute. <laughs> On your first card, write down as many names or one name. Okay. So, it's a lot longer than you think it is sometimes, huh? Um, so, we're going to do another timing. Now, this is a speed, a speed activity. So, we're going to take two minutes, and I want you to write down terms so now that you have them in your mind's eye, you've been thinking about them for a whole minute, <laughs> one or many, I want you to think about why did they come into your brain and write down some descriptive terms about these, these women or this woman. Use adjectives that are either descriptive or abstract. Don't write down their title or what they do, but think about why you admire them in some sense. And I want you to write down as many descriptive terms as you can on your second card. And we're gonna have two minutes and let's go. Okay. All right, it looks like most people are getting close to being done. I know it's sort of weird to have an activity where there's a lot of silence. We done? All right, so, but I actually do that on purpose as, out of respect for you, because I 
absolutely despise having somebody talk while I'm trying to think. <laughs> I am a terrible multitasker, so I don't read my slides. I let people read them when I have them. <laughs> and I don't talk over the activity. So just to let you know, that was on purpose. <clears throat> So this is why we wanted you to cluster together a little bit. I want you to share the adjectives that you just came up with or the descriptors that you just came up with in a group of two, three, whatever's convenient. If you can twist around, I know it's not going to be that long. Uh, try and do your backs. Um, move over if you need to. And, and share one adjective after another and see what you come up with. Here's what I'd like you to do before you start talking, is listen. When you're listening to the other people around you talk, think about if any themes are coming up. Could you cluster some of those? And then we're going to bring back, and I'm going to try and draw out some things from you. OK? Go. <laughs> Thank you all for participating. Yay. All right? You're awesome. All right? So we don't hear that enough, I think. This is my. My big thing this year is to try and tell people they're awesome when they are. Um, it was so cool to hear your voices and you built on each other. There was and some excitement and some electricity here and I could hear it going up and up. All right, so let's hear some examples. This is, this is gonna kill me, I can't, I don't have a flip chart to write on. <laughs> All right, but I'm going to try and write some of them down on a note paper. So give me some of the descriptors, adjectives, terms that you've used. I'll try and repeat them so both Nick, Nikki and um, um, if, if we can get the mics to you, then that's Doing great Doing it Oprah too. style, guy. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's Oprah time. <laughs> or Phil, I'm not if dancing. you're older, right? <laughs> you can dance. <laughs> Phil Donahue, remember that? Uh -huh. All right, so who has a uh, term they want to share that they came up with? Um, well, we had um, resilience and persistence. All right, in graduate school, we called that the persistence gene. I'm going to get it no matter what. <laughs> All right, so resilience and persistence. Uh, we said uh, strength, uh, ethical, being ethical, inspirational, and dedicated. OK. So anybody else? Let's give me one from your group so that, or your list, so that we can get as many from Dr. Levy has agreed to try to get it up okay. on the screen, Dr. Lindsay, too. Um, trailblazer. Trailblazer, ah, okay. Somebody else? Compassion. Compassion. Um, one of the things that we had talked about was um, balance, so being able to be um, a good mom and a good academic and one not coming at the expense of other, like it's possible to be a wonderful mom and a wonderful academic. And then with that, being very daring as well. Caring, okay. Daring, not caring. Daring, sorry. I mean, I, I suppose caring. Okay, too. boy, was that a Freudian <laughs> slip or what? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> daring, okay. I love that. Resilient, daring. Anybody else? We had language uh, related to being conscious uh, and dedicated to social justice. Okay. Um, Excellent. Intelligent. <laughs> yeah, it's good to have an intelligent boss, right? Anybody who's <laughs> not had one? <laughs> All right. So we also had um, effective communicator. Mm. Ah. And I heard somebody say articulate. There you go. Too. Yeah, right. right. On that. An effective communicator. Uh, we had confidence and inner peace. Oh. And those went together? We were thinking we put them together based on what we all shared. We thought that they can be connected, that if you have inner peace, you can have a confidence. But we did talk about whether or we not talk about that could you be confident yeah. without inner peace. <laughs> you, did, you did talk, sorry, I missed that last part. We did discuss whether you could be confident and not have inner peace. So we thought that's possible too, but 
based on what we all shared, those two seem to be connected. Well, and we're talking about people you admire, right? And you, who you might want to emulate, okay? Ooh. Um, we uh, had mentor, we all had mentor, um, and also approachable in some way. Not scary. <laughs> That's a tough one when you're a faculty member, right? Because you're by definition scary, even if you're the nicest person in the whole world. <laughs> the, some of the students are going to think you're scary. <laughs> supportive. Supportive goes with that. Supportive, okay. What does that mean? Supportive of? Ah, okay. I knew there was something hidden there. We had good listener. Good listener. And also um, capable and organized. I had organized too. <laughs> uh, the three that we thought were agreeable between us was um, courageous, passionate, and inclusive. We also had determined um, or driven. Wait, say that again? Determined or driven. Determined. <laughs> Sorry, getting old is terrible. <laughs> Det I, I heard deferment, and I knew that was wrong. <laughs> Determined, OK. And that kind of goes back to the persistence thing in some ways, too, OK. Sorry about that. Whew. Yeah. Okay, we had um, assertive, sane, and both <laughs> compromising and uncompromising. Ah, so tell me a little bit more about sane. <laughs> that wasn't my terrible. I wish I could. <laughs> Like psychologically balanced, those sorts of things. <laughs> and it sounds like somebody who's kind of had a good boss, bad boss thing going. <laughs> and I, I don't mean in like crazy or not right. crazy, like certainly not something that extreme, but um, looking at things with an even keeled mind and thinking deeply about those sorts of things and jumping to conclusions. Okay. Those things. Right. Uh, yeah, that I, a lot of these things are very linked, as as many of us are good at drawing those sort of lines between, right? Okay, so anybody else? Last chance to add something? Ah, okay. Effective. Effective. <laughs> that would be good. Yes. <laughs> All right. I mean, and that makes sense, right? Uh, so I didn't catch everything, but. Yeah, there's more oh, here too. Look, somebody is brilliantly doing this. Thank you so much. <laughs> How effective, yes. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so I shouldn't have been writing this down. I can't read my own handwriting anyway. So, <clears throat> so let, me, let me ask you, what on, on this list do we, so did you give me themes or descript descriptors? Those are, seem more like descriptors. And we've pull, been pulling some themes as we've gone, right? So is there anything in this list that seems like a theme to anybody here? It's OK if it doesn't. Well, right? I, I was going to say that one of the things that struck me seeing all these uh, descriptors go up there was that um, I see this sort of theme of, of uh, balancing that you want somebody who's strong and confident or whatever, but you also want them to be compassionate and a good listener and, and, and these sort of social skills. And one of the things that occurred to me was that if you, if you took away some of the things that deal with being a good listener and, and uh, being compassionate, for example, would that then be a list that applied to men? Right, because there are a lot of things up here that would equally apply to men, but we tend not to say, 
you know, we, we might say, oh, he's a great guy. I mean, he's a horrible person, but look, look at this amazing stuff that- He's that effective. Was, he's effective, right. He's a total jerk, but he's effective. So that's what struck me. Okay, so that's, that's a very interesting segue, but I wanna give anybody else who wants to identify some themes. I actually just want to follow on to that comment because we noticed in our group that the words that we were choosing were gender neutral. And I think that that was because we get so often treated in a gendered way uh, that we wanted to choose the things that were most significant and maybe even subconsciously stayed away from things that might be uh, gender specific. Wow, interesting. I think to some degree, when I look at least through all of mine and all the ones we've talked about, we're in a way kind of asking the impossible because we want them to be listening and hearing and supportive, but also kind of, you know, out there, ass kicking and all this other stuff. And, you know, so we have that duality that women and, and men too confront all the time. You know, how do you have this like, this inner peace and all that stuff, but how do you maintain the anger to get through whatever you need to get through? Or so to me, you know, I think if you had one person that was all of those, I'm not sure it's possible. Right. <laughs> but it's something to strive for. But, you know, um, it's, you know, we're asking people to be unrealistic in a way. Well, but, I, but or, we're not necessarily asking them to be this. So part of what I wanted to do. I do. Yeah, was, was to, and yeah, I mean, any leader, we want them to be unrealistically perfect. That's just, I mean, we, we look one step up. Yeah, I wish they were X, Y, Z, because they're not, right? We're all human. It's the human condition to be imperfect and to want perfection. It's <laughs> that, that dual nature, I guess that's yeah. what strikes me, is that we, okay. we want this and that, and sometimes they, you, know, you have to be able to ship. Right. From a shift from one thing to another that are opposites. So like agile. compromising and uncompromising. <laughs> so agility is something that is a theme that's up there that's unstated in some ways. You know, the ability to dance on your feet, right? And there's one up here. I, I, I'm going to generalize a little bit, but I think this list, list makes sense to me uh, because women are more likely to... Uh, achieve goal through consensus and and this is the type of quality that somebody needs to to build consensus you know listening uh, being compassionate but uh, you know be persistent and working on the goals and it reflects the I don't know if most of these women were people in the academy or not probably not I, I guess with this, such a varied thing but but that Consensus building is a critical value of the academy, and so I, it certainly makes sense that it would be on this list. There was somebody up here, okay. yeah. Oh, here and then up here. So, we will not forget you. <laughs> so my thought with this, and a word that may be missing from there, is flexibility. Right. Right. Uh, because when I think of all these traits, and I think of some of the people that I look at as leaders they're not all of this all the time, right? So there's an ebb and flow type of uh, requirement to being a good leader. Um, and so maybe the key word that to me or a theme that wraps this up is flexibility, the ability to kind of know how to move from when you need to step in and be a good listener versus being an advocator or you know, somebody who's pushing. A, a decider. I remember yeah, that right, term? Yeah, yeah, I like that term as well. <laughs> and to add some intersectionality, right, this is called code switching for right. a lot of, both for gender issues, but also for intersectional feminism and thinking about race issues as right, well. Right. I just wanted to make the point, reflecting on my own list, that I'm willing to bet that many of your cards don't match everything on the screen mm -hmm. and that there are a lot of clusters in here. So while I do see the sort of paradox of being expected, like some of them come right out and say, you know, be compassionate, but be strong. So there's that paradox. Um, but there seems to be space for people that embody only certain clusters of these characteristics sure. in leadership. So maybe instead of being frustrated, like, oh God, I have to be all these things to be an effective leader. My list doesn't have a lot of these things, but other people's list 
might not overlap at all with mine, yet hopefully there's space for all of those people to be successful leaders together. Absolutely. So the point of this exercise was to hear what we value, to hear our voices, not necessarily to expect all of this in a, in a single leader, but it's a very, very important point. Like, let's not turn this into pressure, all right? <laughs> This is supposed to be a positive thing to think about what we, as people who are led or and or as people who lead, what we value in a leader. And maybe it can lead us, sorry to use that word again, but it can lead us to think about what we might want to strive for uh, what are what are areas that we already are good at in this? What might we, if we value this in others, is there some way we can think of actions that we can take to enable these other parts? So when, I don't know, how, how many of you have been in a leadership training where you've had to do one of those test things where you get put in a box? <laughs> Whether it's, um, you know, the four corners, uh, directive versus amiable, or um, the Myers-Briggs or whatever. So they, all, they always, they put you in a box, all right? And they say, don't think about it too much when you're answering the questions. I always think about it too much. Um, <laughs> and I always think it depends, all right? Um, but here's the thing, that's your default, all right? But that doesn't mean that's the kind of leader you have to be if you don't want to be that kind of leader, all right? You can, as a leader, whether it's leading from the side or leading from the middle or leading from the top or the bottom, you can decide activities that will boost your less default characteristics. So I will tell you, I could default to being a directive micromanager, but I've had micromanagers. I despise being micromanaged, as most people do. So I have had to deliberately put processes in place to make me not do that. <laughs> All right, so, so I can boost the things or damp down the things as a leader that I might want to be. So that's how I kind of look at these kinds of lists is, what do I want to be? And how can I make sure I get there in terms of being a leader? But also, what are some aspirations for that? Um, my last thing I wanted us to talk about, you kind of jumped, jumped the gun, which is cool. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you gave me a segue. Um, I do want to say, that I've gone to a lot of leadership programs and read a lot of leadership studies. And I have to say that most of the leadership studies are people who do research on leadership often are touted as these leadership experts. And I've asked them if they include women leaders in their samples and they almost always say no. Um, so they're actually white male leadership studies, which is kind of interesting. I, if anybody has a good way of asking that without making somebody feel completely defensive, I don't do it in public anymore. I actually ask them afterwards because it does make them turn red. Um, oh, I've just been telling you all these leadership characteristics, but I've left out half the population. Um, very fascinating approach. I was just at one a month ago where that happened. So I want to come back to this. What are some of these things on here that are, that wouldn't come up if you were doing this for men or if you used typical leadership studies approach? I mean, confidence is something, ability to make decisions, effectiveness, those are things. So. She said um, compassion. Compassion. There's this, um, 
there's this four, a four category thing. There's directed or directive, amiable, uh, problem solver, and something else I can't remember. But men who get labeled as amiable, who get that category themselves, it's private. When they are asked to go to different areas of the room to talk with other amiables, the men often put themselves in another category because they don't want to be labeled as amiable. So, balance between work and family would not come up. For men. That's an un that's not something you would necessarily see, but we do see it Inner in good peace. male bosses. Yeah, yeah. Inner peace, <laughs> not for men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More recently, even sane or lack of <laughs> lack of right. pathologies. Well, and and so I I'm struck by the parallel to anybody ever done a Seven Habits workshop, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I think that's what it's called. It's been a long time since I did it. Well, his whole uh, it was based on his dissertation. And he went back and looked at historical leaders. Where do you think they came from in general? The military and the clergy, because they were historical figures. Who gets written about in history as leaders? Just, I mean, that's not, in like, as Nikki said, it's not a complaint, it just is, right? Um, you know, the, to the victors go the spoils, but also, I mean, it, the history was written by men in the past. It's not, not as much anymore, but, um, so it's, it's fascinating that all of the things that he, highly effective people, he doesn't say highly effective white dudes, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but, so I just want us to think about this. This has been occurring to me forever as I sit in them and I think, does any of this have to do with me? <laughs> so I just want, I want to raise our awareness to think about what are these leadership qualities? How can we expand the discussion about leadership to include our voices, all of us here, right? To think about what we value and to somehow figure out how we get this represented in our leadership, whether it's our politicians or the heads of our colleges and universities. So one last thing I want to ask you, and then I will end, uh, probably over time. What can we do with this, other than embarrassing a scholar in public, all right? What can we do to, with this information of what we value, how can we help pull this into the conversation so that our views and our voices are heard. Hearing our voices, wasn't that our subtitle today? Yeah. I have to say, I find it quite inspiring because I haven't actually sat, not done a lot of computer research and talked to anyone about that. So I haven't actually sat down and thought about what do I like about women who are in authority in my, growing up, my experience. Um, and I was really, I was really shocked to realize that one of the things that I find most important is just people being grounded. That is something that keeps coming up for me. Excellent. So Well, it's a good way to recognize what you want, what kind of leader you want to be. So think about how this applies to ourselves is one thing we can do. I think, I know that that isn't what you said, but I, I, that's what you were talking about. <laughs> so we could think about what kind of leaders we want to be. So I wrote down a few things. That may be a weird question and hard to understand what I'm trying to get at. But what actions can we take? So a couple of things that jumped up for me encourage women with these characteristics to apply for open positions. I don't know about you, but I get jobs that come across my email. Um, and how often do I send it on to somebody and say, you should apply for this? So that's an example of one thing. Another thing is, if somebody with these characteristics should be at the table and they're not, 
let's try and get them there. Let's talk to the chair of the committee and say, hey, I think, you know, Shyamala needs to be at this meeting, needs to be on this committee. All right? So let's, anything else that you can think of, like actions we can take based on these words and this exercise. Uh, my sister's an amazing leader. She works for a um, huge company, and she always has to go to women leadership conferences all over the place. And, um, you know, one of the things she struggles with is people often term her with the letter B. <laughs> and um, I think just encouraging her, like, I will say to her, like, no, they wouldn't say that to you if you were a man. Like, you're just, just encouraging her, like, you are a good leader. Like, and on the personal level, when you're, not necessarily like, oh, apply for this job, but you're doing a good job where you're at, and you know your subordinates might not value it because of your gender, but you know you still deserve to have that role. So encouraging the current leaders to to not accept that label because it's really I wouldn't imagine I you know not even the B word I was actually mm -hmm. implying, but they oh she's a bully. Her kids even say it like oh it's so funny they laugh about it, but. It's not funny, it's demeaning, and you know, she's just a powerful, great leader, and, um, and it's valuable. You know, what strikes me, um, there's a No More Bossy. Um, have you guys heard of that? It's Condoleezza Rice. I cannot remember the name, but the president of the Girl Scouts. And was it Janet Reno? I can't, they had a No More Bossy Circle, Bossy because that is not a term that is ever applied to men. Nikki will laugh when I say this one. Strident is something you never hear. So how about an action that we can take is never use those terms ourselves. Even if we are thinking it about somebody, let us not use any of those B words mm -hmm. to describe another woman. The word that I actually used was sassy. Um, when I was thinking of the women in my life. And sassy encouraged me to be a woman leader, but it's a word I do not let my own male children use to describe you. girls. <laughs> or, <laughs> or girls, <laughs> right, yes. right. Um, yeah. Um, I was gonna say from, um, I can shout. From the academic perspective, no? Um, it's for the recording. Oh, for the academic perspective, I'm thinking about um, making sure to examine our standards for tenure and promotion um, and look at the language and see that this kind of language is part of those standards and that we uh, use that and promote that language when we say why we want to retain a faculty member or a staff member, why we think they're doing a good job, to kind of keep that language in, the, in a positive, um, visible place in our standards, in our letters, in our recommendations. In your letters, that's to write appropriate, use the appropriate um, verbiage in letters, but also to be able to occasionally, I know, I know in P&T committees, people sometimes say, the, in search committees too. So we have to be brave enough to say, you know, I don't really think you should be saying that. You can say it in a nice way. You could also just kick them under the table, but um, but I think a lot of times people don't realize they shouldn't be saying those things. You can pull them aside afterwards, or you can just say it in a nice way. That isn't really part of the criteria for promotion and tenure. Oop, I'm going to fall over here. Okay, and, and we have up there next. Okay, so okay. you oh, next, and then up there next. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. okay. Sorry. All, right. all right. One, two, three, and then four. Okay. Um, All so, right. So I was going to say um, in terms of mentoring, so not only to our graduate students, but to junior faculty, uh, you know, having really good words and emphasizing those words. And when you give feedback to graduate students, using those words and developing and helping them kind of develop those skills, right? So. Uh, the example being like a good communicator. So if that's, if that's something that helps you move up, then developing those skills with your graduate students, with junior faculty, with junior faculty um, so that you have something very concrete to work towards. 
And how about acknowledging it when they right. are good Absolutely. communicators? Let's, can we all get on the you're awesome bandwagon? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, yeah. okay, she's using a different order than I did. We'll come oh. back to you. Okay, that's all right. I, we should have one person in charge of the mic, and it shouldn't be me. Okay, go. So if okay. we want to make space for different leaders that meet many of these characteristics, I think one of the critical things is that as women move up in leadership, I think there needs to be a real call for senior female leaders to sort of get away from the, how do I say this diplomatically? Um, if you did not get space granted to you for some of these characteristics, you should not punish junior women for not having to go through the sort of dirt that you went through. Right. I still think that that lingers, and I've yes. even seen that coming from females in my own field who purport to be mentors to junior faculty, but there's always this slight edge with, well, you should be balanced, but not until you're 60 and you've earned all of your <laughs> credibility of working through the night and showing up when you know yeah. no one else is expected to show right. up. So I think that needs to be, um, yeah, a call as Wait, women and we're move the up only the ranks, and that's change. hard to do. I think yeah. we're the only people who can change that, right? I mean, we have to acknowledge it was not fair when I had to deal with it. It is so. Why would I put it on you? I mean, it, but we have to confront that and talk to people who say that and say honestly. If it wasn't fair to you, why do you want me to deal with it? You know, we need to talk about it and we don't need to be, we can be assertive without being angry and aggressive. Okay. So I've seen a lot of cognitive dissonance with respect to what we say we want versus then what we go and do about it. Absolutely. And I, I see this, I think, particularly outside of academia, although certainly inside. So we say we want all these characters, but then we turn around and go for the ones that are more traditional male descriptors that fit the seven characteristics, that kind of thing. And I don't have a good way to get around that because I know that talking to my friends who, like, this is what I want in a leader, this, this is what I want, and then they choose a leader that they know, and you can see their heads working around it. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you, you can't get people to go outside their box. So I wanted to put it out there because if you have any suggestions for how do you break down that cognitive dissonance when you you know when people are so controlled by their you know everything they've experienced tradition. the people that are in their lives the tradition yep. the deference to you know their the males around them that sort of thing that they've learned mm -hmm. so i just wanted to put that out there cuz i don't have a good answer <laughs> okay and we're going to hear from I'll pass it to the right there i mean oh Wait, where was okay, was she was next, person? and then some, and then somebody else. I know she was next, right, and then up. you can go. Can I just add really quickly okay. to what Margaret was saying that we need to also have more open conversations about racial issues as well, because right. it's the same kind of thing that you're talking about. And while absolutely um, okay. we're talking about women in academia, but that added later added layer of yes. race for many women, yes. um, not just at Stockton, but yeah. at every institution. Okay. That's an important conversation. Jesse, she, it was Kate, I think, and okay. then and then I'm okay. okay. I wanted to say, well, two things actually. One is that the, uh, the discussion about promotion and tenure and I suffered through this and so why should they? That's not just women. I have it in my entire program or department. Sure. And the men have the same feeling. It's of, a right you know, oh, we yeah. all had you know, such a hard time under a president, two presidents back. Yeah. You know, it's hard not to want other people to have just as much uncertainty and just yeah. as many hoops to jump through. Yeah. Um, so that's not, not just women, but about women, I was going to add that some women on campus here that I've been talking with feel um, men always get longer at meetings. Men get to explain everything very thoroughly. We get to pop in a comment now and then, and our comments are never listened to or, or respected as carefully as the men's much longer <laughs> statements. And one woman in this little conversational group that I have said that the Obama administration staff had this problem. And what the women on the staff started to do was they would just support each other in meetings. A woman makes a short comment that she thinks is valid and some other woman says, 
oh, explain that more. Or they'll go back to the man who's running the meeting and some other woman will say, but if we could get back to her comment, I think there was more we could do there. Absolutely. So I think those are really great ideas. Right. And I hope to put Reinforce some of them in effect. Reinforce and amplify also. We can add one more too. Okay, we gotta get to her because she's had her hand up. Yep. <laughs> Just forward planning. And then here, App, go ahead. Okay. Um, I want to amplify the question about uh, race and its connection with gender in this. We've looked at this list in, in, and I think it's revealing to look at what it implies for men and what it implies for women. But I also want to ask how lists like this inflect differently for, for women of color and to break that down mm -hmm. really um, for Latina women, for black women, for uh, Asian. American women, um, but also how does it inflect differently for um, gender non-binary and non-conforming people? Mm -hmm. I think that the differences, sort of unpacking the differences, and I, I can't do it really instantly, although saying resonates in all of these. Um, <laughs> but there are differences in, um, in individuals experience of how they're perceived and therefore in their mm -hmm. split self-awareness their difference in lived experience sure. um, and also I'm thinking about a lot of these attributes could be called personality traits but a lot of them are not um, they're the, the result of long self-crafting yes. and it strikes me that based on um, one's identity categories, one's experience of domination and subordination, the costs of self-crafting are going to differ markedly. Absolutely. And they're going to differ in where the cost is, right? In terms of, is it your health? Is it your family life? Is it your career? We have, we need to come over here. We had one more comment over here. Yeah, um, what she just said was kind of a great segue into what I was going to say. And also, um, I had the thought when I first heard someone down here mention sassy, because I hate that word. And um, that is often commonly associated with black women. And so when I was making my list, which was um, my first mentor in undergrad, who was the first black woman professor I ever knew, she was none of the things that stereotypically black women are perceived to be. Mm -hmm. And so I, that was always something that I kept in the back of my mind that I will not be a stereotype. So um, she, like when I was writing the list, like I didn't put strong, um, I certainly didn't put sassy, because as I said, I hate that word. So she, represented for me, and she was a demonstration for me, of things that were outside of the common stereotypes and, you know, she's going to be no nonsense and she's going to be this and that as a black woman, she's strong. And so it's funny because in, in my own experiences beyond that, um, and I tell my students this commonly, that I'm often... And it can be exhausting because I'm often faced with scenarios where I have to stop and think about what response do they expect from me and what response am I going to give. And I have to make sure that the response is not what they expect from me. Right. And so even if it might have been my inclination <laughs> to give the expected response, I ha and I have to calculate that all in a matter of, five or ten yeah. seconds yes. so or less. um <laughs> so for example when one of my first full-time teaching positions and three weeks in the secretary said you know i thought you were going to have an attitude so i have to calculate in five or ten seconds whether i'm going to go off on her and give the attitude that she thought i was going to have or whether i'm going to diplomatically respond in a way that she didn't expect me to respond right. and so you know, all of those layers add on top of the being a woman, just yes. as someone mentioned, when you add that element mm -hmm. of race to it, then it's a whole nother ball game because you have to think about 
how you respond and react in various situations. Now, it's been, you know, a couple decades now. It's been long enough for me to be able to do that really quickly now. But as a mentor to students, then I have to kind of talk to them about that, just that whole activity mm -hmm. of, you know, and, and of course I've had to, well, it's not fair the way, yeah, it's not fair, but that's the reality of um, being in a professional setting, whether it's the academy or somewhere else. That, that you have this other layer of responsibility as a woman of color that you have to think about the stereotypes that everybody in the room probably holds, especially if you're the only person of color in the room. Mm -hmm. So those are the kinds of things that you know, we have to consider in this whole conversation. Here um, is a Google image search of what is a professor. So here is your Google image search of professor. So what is our default assumption about who a college professor is based on this sampling from Google Images? <laughs> Old white men, right? Old white men with beards, apparently, too. Um, I did read a study that beards make you more um, uh, trustworthy. So that's interesting. Um, notice also, if you want to find a female professor, some of the other, um, these are based on other things people have looked for with this term. Here's the first one. Who's got a chili pepper on ratemyprofessor.com? Blah, right? Okay, so we have a hot female professor, um, if you want to look that up. There's some different ethnic backgrounds. Um, so we scroll down here to the first female professor, right, um, who uh, is in front of a chalkboard, maybe looking, um, you know, pretty happy with her life there. Um, then we can scroll on down here um, to look at still the overwhelming numbers um, of male professors. Oh, look, our first woman of color, only 18 rows down, right? <laughs> oh, here's another, this is the first one that came up last year for female professor, which was burdened, right? So we can think about some of these other themes and ideas and words that we've been associating. Um, this is also um, for college dean. So when we think about um, administrative roles or leadership roles that many of us, um, we were discussing in the previous session, um, here's some of the um, visuals that come up for that. We do have a, a female here, right? FYI, if you just Google dean, it's dean from Supernatural, if you're into that. And then college staff. We have here more diversity, um, definitely more gender diversity. Um, so we can think about this hierarchically, right? Um, where do women end up in the academy? Where do women um, maybe feel more comfortable in the academy given some of uh, these leadership skills uh, that have been discussed? So a few things that I wanted to note with you guys before um, we do our panel proper. Um, we are going to try to have a little bit of social media presence. So if you want to clock yourself in, if you want to see some photos from the event, um, you can look for the hashtag WIAC, which is Women in Academia Conference 2017. So feel free to use that. Feel free to look that up. OK, so um, our two panelists, um, uh, Dr. Angela um, Lindsay, <laughs> Lynn, not Linz, Lindsay, um, who's going to come up. And then we have our very own um, Dr. Claudine Keenan, um, who I'm going to read her biography for you here. Um, she's the Dean of Education at Stockton University in New Jersey. That's where Stockton is. Uh, Claudine came to Stockton as a chief planning officer who led the Middle States reaccreditation after completing an academic consulting contract for SunGuard Higher Education, where she led the development of an NLNAC accredited hybrid nursing program for Ocean County College in the early 2000s. Prior to that, she served as director of graduate programs at the Marlboro College Graduate Center in Vermont. And Claudine began her career as a high school English teacher in the 80s and became a writing faculty member at Penn State University in the early 1990s. She earned her ED in higher education leadership from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, her master's in arts and rhetoric and composition from California State University Northridge, her bachelor of arts in English from Adelphi University. Outside of work, Claudine runs 5K courses with her husband, discusses great books with their older daughter, 
argues politics with their son and rides horses with their younger daughter. Um, so I want to welcome Claudine um, and Angela to come up for our panels. And then what I want to do very first um, is go back to a little bit of the conversation. So you guys can come up and go here. And I'm going to let them sort of run the Q&A. We're going to do a similar Oprah-style thing for people who have questions. Um, Kate and I are going to run around. Um, and so I wanted to, though, um, finish up with our prior discussion. So I wanted to respond to Janet and the person that spoke over there. Um, this list, the first thing on my list was compassion. Um, I wanted to comment about compassion and assertiveness and how it's racialized and gendered, for example. Assertiveness in people from marginalized and oppressed groups often is perceived as anger, whether or not there's anger being, whether or not the person actually in fact feels angry. So a white woman is asserting herself, she's, uh, she's angry, uh, is perceived as angry. A person of color, woman of color, gender queer person of color like myself is asserting themselves and that's perceived as anger. So, so two things, um, one that, that, that these leadership skills they're even if the person even if the person embodies these skills they're not they're not necessarily um, acknowledged they're not ex necessarily seen and and second that that you know, there's a way there's t I think there's toxic anger well, I, I, we all know there's a huge example right now that we're going to be living under for four years there's toxic anger and then there's um, just, just justifiable, compassionately communicated anger. You know, you're setting a boundary or you're pointing out an injustice. And so is, I don't think that's bad. Do we have to perceive anger as bad? Should anger in women in general and people of color, should it be demonized? No. Should it be condemned? There's a way to communicate it. Which brings me to compassion. I think the compassionate thing to do is point out when somebody is being prejudiced. But when we do that, in whatever way a person is being prejudiced, often a person responds in a really fragile way. Their feelings are hurt. And out of that hurt comes defensiveness or whatever in the communication, it, 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 uh, it, it sunk. So what, what I'm saying is what might make me a good leader? Um, you know, I define, some of these things are defined differently for me and wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be seen in me, um, which would, fu these things would be punk function as barriers to my becoming, to be becoming, uh, function as barriers to my being placed in leadership decisions, hired uh, as a dean, for example. The third thing is that it's harder for people, I think, that live, no, that I know, that, that people that live with oppression every day, multiple oppressions, we internalize it. So it's a lot harder for me to come to the table and say something in a way that's gentle sometimes, because I'm pissed, because I've been through a lot. And I'm, I've, I've, listened, I've listened to just a little bit of the kind of, I, I heard people talking about sexism that they experience here, and sexism and ageism. You know, when you deal with that for five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long, and then you're all you're invited to the table to speak or you want to I mean you might sound pissed off right so do we always I mean are we expecting are we expecting is our expectation that the person that's put in the leadership position is just always going to speak with that is, is really just going to always be even keeled I don't think that's a realistic expectation if that person has been through stuff and sees injustice so that's my comment for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you. That was a nice kickoff, for sure. It was a good bookend. Thank you for leading. <laughs> what you've just done is modeled for us what we will need plenty of in the coming four years. We will need plenty of acknowledgement of the anger and the resentment that will be built up over time about not just perceived injustices, but actual acts of aggression, and mm -hmm. you know, not just micro either real aggression that's coming. So please continue speaking exactly as you had. You weren't riled up, you didn't come across as angry, you came across as a leader with a conscience and an awareness. And sometimes that's what most of us need just to be reminded when we're missing something really important in the conversation. So thank you. What, what struck me about what you were saying is that it is a good reminder for us to make sure we're not filtering things in the wrong way. Mm 
that we're not filtering what we're hearing through stereotypes or, um, or through um, a lack of awareness. So, I mean, we have to speak up for each other and we have to think about, that's why I made the last question about action. What can we do? So when we see somebody who's speaking up and who's pissed for good reason, we can be supportive. And we need to think about what that action looks like for the rest of us to be supportive of that. How can we be aware that this is going to happen and does happen, and what can we do about it? I mean, we really need to think about our own behaviors and our own actions in being supportive of others. One of the themes that we saw again and again through the book are how critical we are of one another. You know, how quick we are to pounce, especially at the slightest little disagreement, if we feel, oh, you, you didn't quite get me there, or you're not capturing what we all think when you say that. And just in a casual conversation on my way out, out of the room for the break, I had an uplifting experience with a colleague just talking about how we can build better how we can, if we find that point of disagreement, that point where you didn't quite get me or you haven't actually spoken for me or for all of us, that's the moment where we say to each other, how can we get better together? Rather than calling that other woman out for missing it or not quite capturing all of what we should be saying. This is a time for us to build together. Question. Whoa, sorry. <laughs> I'm loud. Um, so, if there are other questions or comments, um, we're happy to talk about them. This is the open forum kind of time. Last year's feedback was people wanted more time for these types of discussions. So, um, any topics folks are interested in? Um, I'm glad that we're discussing uh, issues of. Uh, this is a hard word for me to pronounce. Intersectionality, um, um, and specifically about faculty, women faculty of color and queer women in academia. Um, there's uh, something that is uh, being discussed um, a lot lately um, is how um, it's harder for faculty of color to uh, achieve tenure. And uh, one of the things that tend to happen is that uh, faculty of color is asked to serve in every single community and which uh, ends up uh, eating uh, the time that they need to complete the things that are then considered uh, during the tenure process. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, what I see is complete invisibility for uh, queer uh, faculty women, um, so they could be making a contribution, of participating in service and being visible, um, but you know we have this uh, uh, opposite. And, uh, if, if you're a person of color, a woman of color, then you have to serve on everything, and if you're a queer woman, then there's no space for you at all. And, so now discuss. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> discuss amongst yourselves, yes. Well, Luis, you brought us to an intersectionality moment you know, where we can talk a little bit about those contradictions. You can only serve on just so many committees. You can only be representing on just so many ways and at just one time, you're one person. Learning how to say no is a very important technique for all of us to be leaders and successful in whatever our goal is. Without saying no, you can sometimes just articulate priorities. What's more important at this time? It's very important to serve on this committee as soon as I've completed this article. It's very important. Oh, I like that phrasing. It is very hard, though, to say no as a pre-tenure faculty member or as a, a faculty member who's on a contract um, a full-time teaching faculty or a full-time research faculty. It's, you're in a subordinate position and it's, it's risky to say no. So I like that I'm gonna juxtapose these two things and make you, the leader, make that decision. 
acknowledging that there are competing um, priorities. Mm, that, I, you know, when I think about this, I think about being, um, we need to be growing leaders who don't put people in those binds, right? And, and part of the way I think we do that is by talking about this so that we make other people aware. I, I know that's a future thing and it sounds sort of... Hopeful. <laughs> it sounds like I'm sort of blowing off the, the problem, but I, you know, we have to be training our leaders to not be putting people in these positions or to be putting people in these positions, sort of the two ends of your spectrum. We need to think about representation, but we also think, need to think about the binds that we're putting um, you know, pre-tenure faculty or contract faculty in. We call them fixed-term faculty at Penn State. I don't know what you call them here or at the other institutions, but um, yeah, there's always a balance. I, I, I think the full professors in the room need to be speaking up <laughs> um, because really you guys are the safe, you're in the safe position to protect your colleagues in many ways. And I know it's hard and I'm asking you to do something that is risky for you, but you're the, you're the best people to do that. <laughs> and after you, your family and your colleagues, the people who most want you to be tenured and retained here are your deans. <laughs> so make sure you ask for help. Well, we're here to protect and serve, basically, not to quote that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> but basically, we're here for you. you know, yeah. Deans are here in service to the faculty so that we can all serve the students better. That's why we're here. We have a comment here, and then Kate will go to death. Um, so I have a, a point about, um, just going back to the point about women supporting each other, um, just you know, looking at, again, at all those words up there, how women are very effective by being supportive of each other, but I'm sure most women or all women in this room can comment on their experiences where women are the first to criticize each other as well and be more critical of women rather than men. Um, and so I wonder, A, if that's something that's kind of been holding women back in, in terms of social progress and, and B, like how, how, why, how can women actually, you know, defy this character, this paradox, this characteristic that um, seems to make us, you know, subconsciously or consciously attack one another. And why does that happen? Why can't we, why is our instinct to do that? So. Honestly, I've challenged somebody who said that. Um, I was just shocked when she said, but I had to go through this, so they should too. And I was just stunned at that point that I said, wait, you know, kind of what I said earlier, which is, what, it wasn't fair that you had to do that, so why is it fair that you want me to do it or that other person to do it? And I think we have to, and it wasn't in a mean way, it was, but I mean, you really have to, we're, we are all smart people here, and we need to trust that we can have those discussions. Now, it could get heated, but we have to allow that and, and still remain colleagues. Um, I think, you know, we want to shoot for light, not heat, but, um, but if it gets heated, then we can stay colleagues, but at least we've said our piece. And I, I was in a leadership training with a bunch of women um, in the HERS leadership training. Have you guys heard of that? higher education resources, something. And um, it's like women administrator boot camp. And there was a contingent from South Africa and they called, they had this phrase called PhD, pull her down. And oh gosh, that was over <coughs> 10 years ago and I haven't forgotten that. So I think we can't change other people's behaviors. I mean, we all know that, right? We cannot change other people's behaviors. We can only change our own. So I think making a commitment, think about the power of the commitment of everybody in this room. If we said, we're not doing that anymore, and we're gonna do this if somebody we know does it to try and stop that, we could have a huge ripple effect. 
to Angela's point, you know, you might watch it happening when some woman is tearing another woman down. That's your moment to act. That's your moment to build both women back up. That's really all we can do at the end of the day, as Angela said. We can only influence our own behavior, our own action. And maybe by doing that, if you're building them back up, this will be an opportunity for those women to pick up from there. Um, I wanted to go back to something um, that I think Leanne is that you're, said about anger, which I, I think anger is so important. Um, and I think that I hear a little bit here people almost like turning themselves inside out to talk about how we're going to be angry without being angry. We're going to be angry diplomatically. We have to not show our anger. We have to be a, a assertive without being aggressive. And I, I always think about a real, that really wonderful essay by Audre Lorde, The Uses of Anger, which talks about how important anger is um, for social change and for personal change and transformation. Um, and I think women in particular, and for good reason, I'm not doubting why people um, step away from anger or are advised not to be angry, and there's different kinds of anger, as you said, productive and unproductive anger, but sometimes we have to embrace anger, I think, and use it to compel us to kick ass, to move forward, to be supportive, to reject racist and sexist and homophobic and other kinds of horrible actions and statements and policies. I, I think, you know, I even, I'm thinking about Hillary because I think so much of this list is you know, generated from the election. And I saw her twisting herself into little pieces to not be angry sometimes. And I wanted her to, you know, just stop and say like, <laughs> and, you know, go away and don't stalk me and, you know, back up, buddy, right? And I don't know if that, and I don't know if that would have been better or worse, but just sometimes I think, um, particularly those of us, you said, you know, full professors, I'm recently a full professor and I feel a lot more empowered to say and no, and that we're not gonna do that and to say that on behalf of other people as well. And I encourage junior faculty to come to me if they need someone to say for them um, or you know, to speak if they feel that it's not safe for them to do so because I, I'm not too worried about it right now in, in this context, I feel like I can. I also, so I also wanna go back to something Luis said though and then I'll stop talking, but just, because um, I felt like that, he talked about the invisibility of um, queer faculty um, and you, in, in contrast to the overextended issues that um, faculty of color sometimes deal with, particularly junior faculty of color, but also senior. Hi, Donnie, I see you. <laughs> and, um, and, and I just, I, I don't have anything to say about that point. I just hope that other people will come back and, and re talk about that point because um, I'd like to hear more about how people are experiencing that and to think about what we can do um, to change that. Collectively, yeah. So there's a broader conversation about work-life space, balance, whatever you wanna choose to say um, in the US and abroad too that cuts across class, gender, and race. Where do you see the role of the academy in contributing to the conversation and advancing the conversation into real policy change? Mm. And the catch is, do you think that our inability to adequately address these issues in the academy weakens our power and our inability to influence real policy change? So I'd be curious to hear hmm. your thoughts on that. Like, can we not get out of our own way, I guess, <laughs> is what I'm asking. If not us, who? Yeah. You know, this is supposed to be the first place where ideas, good ideas, are vetted and tried, experimented, and uh, tested to see what works. And if not here, where else will those conversations happen? We accept the challenge. I think the faculty have done a fantastic job here at Stockton the past year or so talking about family-friendly teaching and meeting modules. That's an important conversation that really hadn't been taken up in a serious way with that specific concern in mind. It's been taken up perennially here at Stockton. Those of you who have been here a really long time know we talk about the modules and we bring them out every couple of years and we put them back away again. But I don't think that's gonna happen this time. 
I think that there's some real movement uh, towards saying having meetings at 4.30 in the afternoon is not family friendly. Um, mm -hmm. For that matter, having forced meetings at any given time is not necessarily family friendly. Careers are not family friendly. There's a tension that has to happen between balance. You know, you wouldn't be learning the balancing skill if there weren't some tension. But I think we're in a better position to try that out here, where there are now a number of voices of people who understand and are living that same experience. When Stockton started, our founding mothers and fathers were not necessarily people raising small children. That wasn't the career path at that time. Anybody here from the Mayflower? I was telling Angela about the Mayflower earlier. It's not a metaphor for those of you who are not from Stockton. We started in a Mayflower hotel in Atlantic City, a condemned hotel. Um, but I think, yeah. Well, they didn't start as a hotel. They started teaching. We in started a hotel. teaching. That's right. In, in a condemned hotel. In a condemned, in a condemned hotel. hotel. Even better. Uh, where even then, great ideas were born about how the curriculum would be more conducive to embracing the liberal arts, even as professional schools grew up around our founding. So yeah, I, 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 we accept the challenge, and I think this is the place where it has to happen. I don't have very many other good models. Has the committee found other good models at other institutions where it's really happening well in academe? Anybody serving on that committee? The module what is committee? the, it's a work-life balance committee? It's actually or? about the moving the modules, when we teach, when we meet, about moving uh, the schedule of when we teach and when we meet. Well, I know some of our Commonwealth campuses. So Penn State has a big, big research campus. They have medium-sized graduate and undergraduate campuses, and then five of those, and then 19 mostly undergraduate campuses, smaller. And they have a common hour. And it's usually in the middle of the day, and usually around lunch or next to lunch. Um, and th that seems to work very well for um, a unit that's kind of the size of a college. Um, so the campus, a smaller campus, might be equivalent to the College of Science um, at the big campus, um, which we do not call the main campus. Um, but the, the Common Hour has been a very successful module for, for or not module, but approach to that. Um, at least from my perspective in seeing that. Um, but I also think um, a place where this, where you could have a big impact on that is talking with HR. Mm -hmm. um, because staff lives are dictated top down, right? Through HR. And, um, and, I th and we have far more staff generally than we have faculty. <laughs> um, and in my, I have sort of half faculty and half staff in my department. And where I have seen the biggest impact is on being family friendly to staff. And whether that's for um, not giving them grief about having family, having to take care of family things, allowing them flex time, or um, uh, what was the other thing I was thinking of? Oh, out of my head. <laughs> anyway, but I think that managers and supervisors have huge amounts of power over their staff and whether to, and they are the people who determine whether a department or an office or a unit is family friendly to the staff. So I think if you can get with your if you can get your VP or whoever's the head honcho in HR to start sending that message down the line, I think that's a huge thing. Um, you know, I, faculty do have a lot more flexibility than staff do. They're much more restricted. I've just, you know, having that sort of dichotomy in my office has really made me appreciate just how much power supervisors and managers have over the staff. So I think that's a critical way to make a difference, yeah. is invite HR in. Um, okay, so um, I'm actually 
going back to a, a point that was raised before, which was in regards to kind of having to deal with bosses who are kind of like, I went through the ringer, so you should put through the ringer. Mm -hmm. And also to the point that was made uh, before about how when you really reach kind of that full professor status, it's liberating, right? Because you now, <laughs> you're, you're feel more secure and, and uh, can say no to more things. And when I think about those things, I guess the point that I, that I, that I guess I wanna raise and maybe get your input on is encouraging women to reach out to other women for mentorship. Um, I think one of the things that, um, that I found in my own career that was very helpful was having uh, somebody who was just a little bit ahead of me, not too far ahead, because I, I, I think the best mentors are the ones that are just a little ahead of you and can kind of show you, don't make that mistake, or I did this. Um, and while it would be great to say, reach out and find a female mentor, the reality is, in many cases, there aren't that many uh, in the leadership position. So um, I know many of my mentors were actually male, white males, uh, that uh, helped me navigate things. Um, and so, you know, because, I mean, I find it really kind of disheartening to hear that that's still happening, that, that you know, that people, that women are still kind of doing that to junior women. Um, Maybe I was living in a bit of a bubble thinking that there, because I, 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 I'm in a leadership position and I know other colleagues of mine, we make an effort to reach down and work with junior female faculty. That's, that's like a, an active goal for me is to, how do we promote junior faculty? Um, so I think there's more women like that now taking that leadership. So for those of you facing that, don't lose hope. <laughs> I think that there are the women that are coming up into new leadership position have more of a kind of um, different mentality in terms of really supporting each other. Uh, but, but I do think that that network model, that mentoring model it is critical uh, because when you get shut down by one person, you have now somebody else to bounce it off of and you can check your own sanity. Like, you know, am I crazy? Did, you know, did I take this the wrong way? And you have another perspective. So just for that value alone, I think it's something that, um, that as you're moving up, we should incorporate into our own careers and into our own development. I absolutely agree. I, as you were talking, a couple of things came up for me. So there's actually a research literature on mentoring, believe it or not. Um, a lot of it's from nursing, not surprising, um, but um, some from education, but all from the business world. There's an amazing congruency across that literature, though, about mentoring. Here's a couple of the key points from it. Collect as many mentors as you can you don't have to tell them you're a mentor, that they're a mentor to you. You can just see them that way. And then if you get to know them, you can say, I, you know, I, I kind of consider you a mentor, which is often an honor, all right? Because we know those assigned mentor things sometimes don't work. Um, so seek out, as, collect them. Just collect as many as you can. And it gives you that multiple perspective Peers are excellent, and near peers are really excellent mentors, absolutely. Your peers are, are potentially really great mentors, even if you have a group of three to four other pre-tenure faculty from different units, you can be supportive to each other. So you don't always have to be a, you know, way advanced. Of course, if you wanna get in on the culture and the rules and all the unwritten rules, Definitely, you need some experienced folks. Um, I, I try and stay away from junior and senior because people don't really like those labels. <laughs> but you need both junior and senior mentors. And um, here's the other thing. Get to know the people in this room. These are your potential mentors. Um, these are people who already have stated their 
that they care about this. Um, so you can seek out people. Sometimes, you know, in a, I was in a peer mentoring group for finishing dissertation, a writing, dissertation writing group. We produced six out of seven of us got our PhDs. And we would not have finished without each other. And we were at varying levels and we just, it, so I am a true believer in this idea. We're still in touch. It's now been more than 20 years, maybe more than 30, and we still stay in contact. And some people, some of us still list our goals every week. <laughs> no lie. But um, these people have declared their accessibility by being in this room. So contact if it doesn't click. Sometimes it just takes somebody saying, hey, do you want to get together for lunch and talk about whatever projects we're working on? Sometimes you just need a mini leader to do it, and everybody else has been waiting. So we kind of joke about this colleague of ours, that she's our fearless leader, which she hates, because she doesn't want to be called that. But if it wasn't for her saying, we need to do some peer mentoring, we never would have done it, and some of us wouldn't have finished. And one of the best ways to find a mentor is to be a mentor. So there's somebody in this room, or somebody who's not here in this room, that you wish would have been in this room. Go mentor. Um, hi, Claudine and Angela. Um, as a professional staff member, and I don't know how many staff members are here in the audience, but I just want to let you know that we face the same challenges as faculty members. Um, we're perceived the same way as women, um, maybe asking for a raise or, or, or a promotion. Uh, we might not be perceived as assertive. We are perceived as bossy. Um, so we could actually have a conference just for staff members. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to the forefront, okay? I'm glad you yeah, did. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Margaret. Is it me? <laughs> so um, I guess I'm kind of going back, to, it's sort of tying maybe the work life balance also with some of the things you were talking about. about I, I, I don't know, all of it. I, I, I'm a full professor. I've been a full professor now for three years. I've been here at Stockton for 20 years. So I did, like many women, go up a little later than I perhaps should have. Um, and I've seen some changes. When Stockton first started, which was long before I got here, um, the people who founded Stockton, it was very much the hippie college in the, in the oh, woods. It was, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, and when I first got here, I thought everybody, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it was still, you had that, even in the, the 90s, a little bit of that resonance. Um, the faculty couldn't find schools that they liked for the kids around them, so they actually created their own school and they all, uh, taught in it, men and women together teaching their children. Um, and I bring this up because I know you had said, well, they didn't really have children, but there were lots of kids. They had, this is why we have free to be, which for people who aren't from Stockton, this is the child care center on campus. Um, things that made Stockton so incredibly attractive to me. Now, of course, we don't have the Stockton School for Kids anymore. That kind of fizzled out as, um, you know, we got more faculty and as the school got bigger. But I think as our schools grow and as it becomes more complex, and now we know that there's so many more demands on our time in terms of, you know, I, you know the computers have actually taken up more of our time. The iPhone, which has now been around for 10 years, as you may have heard yesterday, yeah. um, all of these things actually allow work-life balance to get even further out of whack. And I think while some things have always been around, I think the, the idea that there can only be one, you know, a successful woman in a department, or a successful gay person, or a lesbian person, or a person of color, you know, this Highlander attitude towards success, um, where women have chipped away at each other for years. That's still been around. What I see is that there's often a difference in tone and, and nastiness. Um, so I know within my field, I'm a paleontologist, the way that women are experiencing harassment now is, you know, I expected to get my butt pinched. I expected that when I, you know, I expected to have uh, people say inappropriate sexual comments to me um, as a paleontologist, because it's a very male-dominated field, and um, very much like archaeology, right? And uh, I expected to be told, well, you know, 
women, we can't take them in the field because men just want to have sex with them. So I expected that kind of crap. And if you want to talk about that, come to my STEM thing this afternoon. But <laughs> what I'm seeing now is young women getting up and giving talks at meetings and being harassed on Twitter during their talk. You know, like, what a stupid woman, or she looks like a slut, or not by other women, but by young men who don't oh. seem to realize their names are attached to their Twitter account. <laughs> um, and wow. I see a level it's of trolling. nastiness too, even here oh, at no. Stockton, in the kinds of comments like you guys were talking about towards more junior faculty. I mean, I think that kind of, well, I went through it, so you must go through it too. I certainly experienced that as a, a junior faculty member, you know, but more in a, I'd say, maternalistic tone in that, well, honey, you just, you know, when you get older, you'll recognize, you know, how much more you need to know. So, I, and I, I don't know if that's a little bit better, but, you know, it was sort of nastiness coded in that we're going to help you <laughs> kind of thing. So I, I just wanted to bring that up because, I, you know, I've been in academia now for 30 years, and I feel like the, we're seeing this, you know, not just in academia, but I think across America as a whole, there's been a lid that's been ripped off. And not just since the election, yeah. but it was starting before that. And I think these, this Twitter event that I was talking about, that happened two years ago at a professional conference. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, and actually it was a year, uh, I keep looking at you, Matt, because you're a paleontologist too, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> at, um, at paleontologists, I'm also a physical anthropologist, at our conference, the same year, all this crap happened. Wow. Something is going on. And we need to be aware of that, that a lot of the more maternalistic or paternalistic, you know, holding back of our, our female um, peers, it, it's, it's going into another level now. And harassment, I think, is crueler. I'd rather have my butt pinched any day than have somebody <laughs> take me down on Twitter. Yeah. You know, it's just, yeah. if humiliate, you know, you can attack my science, that's nastiness. You can pinch my butt, you're really not attacking who I am. Um, and I'll tell you to go fuck. I can say that because I'm a full professor now. So, <laughs> and actually I said that as a grad student too, so. Um. <laughs> Margaret, who asked the tweeters to leave? Who actually escorted them out of the session or away from oh, the Oh, well it wasn't, so at, at the time, so in the session, so the, the nice thing about paleontology is at that time we had this giant screen that scrolled all the tweets. And these idiots actually put hashtag SVP 2014 or whatever on it. And so it was people outside in the hallway saw what these guys were tweeting and I, everybody was stunned. It was one of those things that went so beyond the pale that nobody knew what to do. Now because of it, um, we do have certain policies but they still, there's, how do you punish a person like that? You know, we have all sorts of rules in my society for doing things if you sell fossils, if you do other things that are ethical, you know, if you plagiarize, but we're still trying to craft a policy for sexual harassment because in that case it was pretty obvious they did it, right? Nobody stole their phones. Mm -hmm. But in the case of the he said, she said, you know, he pinched my butt, he came on to me, he groped me, um, whatever. They, particularly because our leadership to some degree is male and older female who have this, it happened to me, you just have to get over it. Um, I, I, I'm not seeing the change that, that I'd like to see. And I will say I am in a leadership position in my professional society. Um, I'm the membership chair. I ran for president last year. I didn't win because I actually put stuff like, we need to stop harassing women. We need to, and I don't think that was too popular in a male-dominated society. But, um, but you're going to apply again. You're going to put your name yeah, forward again. Yeah, I may again. wait a, a little bit because there's, you know, the, the person who I ran against was another woman who's also a very strong woman. So, frankly, if I hadn't been running, I would have voted for her too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think my purpose has been served. They had two, of, two women who were too similar in some ways running against each other. But and Margaret, I hope you keep helping her to develop that policy because you need that. You need well, I, I think because, because I'm, um, as you know, once I got full professor, I started making a lot of noise here too. <laughs> More about buildings, right? But, um, and uh, it, yeah, I, I still, um, I, we now have a, a committee 
to form a committee on LGBTQ and, and women and people of color is issue because of course, um, we're one of the few societies, we have a very active LGBTQ group, cool. but we have no like, you know, and we have an active women's group, we don't have much of an active people of color group or international, or, so um, not everybody has a, a voice and, and we're working on it. The Twitter thing stopped, and I think those um, two men who were, I think, grad students and postdocs, do you know? Um, no, no. Everybody knows who they are. I can't see them ever getting jobs. Um, I haven't actually seen them in the last year or two, and they were not people I knew. They were dinosaur people. <laughs> <laughs> they were just this. Literally. I'm a mammal person. So and metaphorically. Yeah. <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> And I'm going to bring the microphone over here to Dr. Allison, whose hand was up earlier. Um, so on a, on a more hopeful note, we were talking about this notion of the, you know, I went through it, so you have to go through it. Um, and I do think that what Angela mentioned earlier about it changing as we in this room become those women and in you know, leadership positions because I remember that when I, I wasn't here at Stockton when I had my first two children, but I had them very close together. And um, so by the time my son was eight months old, I was pregnant again. And I had to go to my department chair who was, you know, a woman who had raised twins. They were adults at that time, but I thought, you know, I was nervous about telling her I was pregnant again, but I didn't think I would get the response that I did. And so when I told her, um, she rolled her eyes at me and she gave this big sigh, like, oh, like this is, you know, as if this is just so inconvenient and stupid, right? <laughs> so I was hurt. I mean, I just, I couldn't believe that her response was so in my face. Even if she felt that way, I thought, wow, she just did that right here in my face while I'm sitting here. So um, I, I distinctly remember thinking about that when I was coordinator of communication and, you know, faculty came to me and said she was having her second child, which I was very supportive of. Okay, we're going to work this out. We'll just figure out your schedule. You know, so because in my mind I was thinking I would never want somebody to do to me what she did to me when I, you know, because I, I, was, I wasn't planning to have them so close together, but I knew I wanted more than one child, so I wasn't unhappy, but for her to react that way was such a slap in the face. So those are the kinds of things I think we need to do, is think about, you know, our experiences that we perceive negatively, and then when we're in those situations as leaders, we have to bring that to the forefront and say, you know, the last thing I would want to do is make a person feel the way I felt in a similar situation. And, you know, so I just helped her work out the scheduling so that everything would be fine. And I do, and even here at Stockton, you know, I do, I've had conversations with folks, women who've been here for, you know, 30, 40 years, and one of the things that I remember hearing as we began talking about the module conversation and changing, you know, family friendly issues, I remember actually two of them talking about the fact that, you know, when we were raising our children, we had to make sure that we didn't talk about having our kids a lot. Like we didn't talk about that. We, we just had to make sure that we were able to do everything the men would do even though we were raising children. So it was like, you know, her, it was kind of them criticizing the fact that like, why do you guys keep talking about having your children so much? And why do you keep talking about the fact that you have to pick them up by a certain time? Why are you doing that? You should just be showing that you can keep up. And so there was that mentality that, you know, you, you shouldn't be doing it that way. You should be doing it this way because we had to, you know, do all of those things and prove that we can keep up without talking about our children and without talking about the fact that we were mothers. Um, and so, again, I, I register that as, okay, I'm not gonna do that. Like, I, you know, that's something that I'm not gonna do. Um, so I think it's really important for us um, 
you know, in this room who are recalling having these kinds of conversations to know that, okay, so when a junior faculty comes to me about something similar, let me remember what I didn't like that was said to me. Um, and then just on the last note, I've heard a, a few people talk about the fact that, you know, once you become a full professor, and it's kind of making me laugh every time I hear that because, you know, I, I just got the, um, you know, letter that I've been promoted, but, <laughs> thank you, but I don't feel um, that that is in any way relaxation because I have worked more post-tenure than pre-tenure, and I worked pretty darn hard pre-tenure, and that goes back to the whole being a faculty of color and can you do this and can you do that and can you do the other? And for me, it's not even an, yes, I can say no, of course I can say no, but for me, it's always that issue of, well, crap, who's gonna do it if I don't do it? And so now I'm often in that position where I feel like, yeah, it's important that, you know, somebody have a seat at the table who's a person of color, and so I guess I gotta do that too. And so there's that, be and that's more so because of the fact that I feel um, invested in Stockton. So I feel like, okay, I gotta do what I can do to help out. And of course, one of the big things I'm trying to do is increase diversity so that other people can do other things. But <laughs> I, I <laughs> so it's not so much that I'm, you know, senior faculty and haven't mastered the art of saying no, it's more so that I feel like, shoot, I'm kind of obligated because there's not enough to go around. And um, so that is yet another layer of the, the, the pressure, I guess. Well, what, in response to that, I think we have to all be aware that it is, should not only be faculty of color who raise issues about faculty of color or students of color. Um, some very honest people have said to me, I'm getting tired of it. I'm getting tired of always being the one that has to raise this. And, um, I, and I, I want to be clear that full professors may or may not have the ability to say no, but they do have the ability to speak up for their less powerful um, colleagues, both tenured and pre-tenured faculty, or or fixed term faculty. So yeah, I think you're pro I would never question that you still feel that obligation um, for sure, but we, we need to help pick up the slack on that. Uh, we absolutely do. Um, so I just wanna say so much all of this. Um, I've experienced pretty much everything everybody's talking about. I had my son when I was in a postdoc position, I got two weeks off. Um, was very generous because our union had not negotiated any time off for postdocs. So the professor I was working with said, you know, good news, I've worked this out for you. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> like, wow, you have five kids. How do you not know that this is not good news? Um, <laughs> so that was, you know, seven years ago. So now I'm actually in administration at the Institute for Advanced Study, which is in Princeton. It's a very small institution. And I'm going to be talking at one of the panel sessions about what we're doing, and it's kind of cool because the institute, the optics are super bad right now. We have 23 faculty, we have one woman. I'm not even kidding you. Um, but the good news is that we have a really progressive director, and we have me, um, and a few other people who are really committed to changing that dynamic drastically. Um, so this dream of, well, why can't we just take into consideration people's commitments on committees or, you know, the fact that they have small children or any of these things, you actually can. And at a small institution, you can do it really quickly. Um, so we're, we're not a typical university, so what I'll talk about doesn't directly translate into a university situation. Um, and I'm not going to say that we have the fruits of our labor to talk about yet. This is very much a work in progress. Um, but it's kind of neat to see how when you have people who say, you know what, all of these rules are literally all of them are self-imposed. So if we want to stop and say, we are not where we want to be. We don't want to have a faculty of 22 white men and one woman who's also white. But, um, you know, that's, that's not the dynamic that we want. And we have a major, a, a very large fellowship program. 
which is about 20% women. Part of that's pipeline issues, but part of it is really policy and selection and culture. And so um, we very sort of, I'm gonna say it recently, started putting some things in place that I really hope are gonna change this dynamic. Um, so unfortunately I can't stand here at this point and say, hey, we had 22 uh, white guys and now we have you know 17 uh, women and people of minority status, but I'm hoping that when I come back in a few years, I can. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so this is just so mm -hmm. great. And I have to say, I was at a conference in Denver last week. Um, it was the American Historical Association Conference, and I was talking on work-life balance, which was funny because I had flown in at four in the morning and then was taking a red eye home that night so I could be with my son. Um, so not <laughs> living work-life balance, just talking about it. Um, <laughs> but the women on the panel, and they were all women, and they were all academics, uh, you know, everybody is experiencing this. Yeah. And there's so many of us that I just have to believe that, you know, we keep having these conversations and we get to positions where we can start making policy and we do it smartly and we do it to pay forward, um, you know, good ideas and we'll make a difference, so. Mm -hmm. You know, some very wise people told me when I was impatient about the pace of change of certain things, um, gave me really good advice, look 10 years backwards and 10 years forwards, and there really is change. Change in the academy is slow, but change does happen. But you have to apply for those positions of department head, as associate dean, as dean, to get that, you gotta stay in the ranks and go up. And being an administrator isn't terrible. <laughs> I know it's called the dark side, but you know, but yeah, you're right. We can make policies that change. And I don't know about your faculty senate here, if you have a faculty senate and if they're strong, but you know, senate, senate voices can be heard as well. I mean, I've worked in places where it was both. Boy, at Penn State, if faculty senate gets involved, watch out. <laughs> They'll wordsmith it to death, but they'll get it done. <laughs> 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> so uh, going back to the saying no, and, um, and I actually had something to say in direct response. To, I should have written it down. It's gone. 41, it's gone. It's just gone. Um, I agree that saying no, saying no is very important. Took me a long time to learn. A lot easier to do when the senior faculty are supportive of you saying no. Yes. So my point is that those of us that occupy positions of privilege and power need to, it's critical that we self-interrogate, right? So faculty, tenured and tenure track faculty should be thinking about adjuncts and should be thinking about staff. And white people should be thinking about people of color and straight people should be thinking about queer people. And I. It's also when, when and, and not just thinking about them, but thinking about our privilege, thinking about our whiteness, thinking about our wellness, thinking about our straightness, self-analyzing, admitting when we make mistakes, go educating ourselves. And actually, when you're not being directly targeted for the oppression, it's easier to speak from a non-angry place. So I really appreciate Absolutely. it when white people, because I'm like, God, if that came out of my mouth, <laughs> yeah. that would not have gone, it, I would not have sounded that way. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's nice. yeah. yeah, absolutely critical. I just wanted to add, um, kind of piggybacking off of what several people have been saying, is that another thing that's very important to me, and part of the reason for starting this conference, is to support each other. So we've talked a lot about mentorship and about having someone just above you that can support you, but I'm also um, a, a very big proponent of, you know, complimenting and, like you said, being awesome, like telling people that work with you how wonderful they are. Um, and so like my relationship with Kirsten as a staff member, like to me, I always think she's amazing. It goes above and beyond. And my sense is that she doesn't necessarily get that recognition. I think it's important to say it and to have it said out loud and in multiple different places so that they can get the recognition they deserve, um, whoever that is and whatever position they're in. Um, I think of when we were talking about mentorship, Marissa Levy. I mean, I would see her as a colleague of mine, but also as such an important mentor to me. Um, and that's another important 
place to say thank you for all that you do, not just for me, but for others. And to say, hey, this is a really good person who's a wonderful mentor and you should talk with her. But she has the right to say no, she doesn't want to do it too. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention as we're sitting together as um, a group of academics, the you know cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience literature on implicit biases. And people have talked about this sort of duality between sort of what we think is right and what we sometimes do. And I think that this literature and the research base can be helpful in terms of thinking about policies that we all have implicit biases, not only against others, but against ourselves, right? In terms of our belief of what we can do as a woman or a person of color or whatever it may be. So in terms of moving forward and advancing the conversation, I do think that that research base in particular can be powerful in terms of making people aware of their biases. So rather than sort of pointing a fig finger, it's let's look at what the literature says and how there really is support that we make these unconscious sort of quick decisions that are based on these implicit biases and sort of raising awareness about that to affect change. There was a article recently in the Chronicle about that and, and a controversial one, but um, but I think you made the right distinction of recognizing that we make these unconscious decisions as opposed to can it help, I mean, does just knowing that change our behavior? No, it takes work to do that. And so that's really great to bring that up. So we have about five minutes left. I'm gonna hand this to Betsy and then I saw this hand and that hand and then we'll do any final things and then we'll have lunch where we can all talk more. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to respond to Luis and Deb's comments and questions about uh, queer faculty issues. Um, and I think two things are on my mind. One is that I think there's very, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be one of those people who's like, it's the same, but I think there are related issues for faculty of color, women faculty, queer faculty in that, you know, particularly at Stockton, well, pretty much, pretty much everywhere I've been, there's um, a very odd rhetorical umbrella with respect to LGBTQ issues uh, that we live under and have to navigate on a daily basis. But I think that there are very similar issues to what I see my colleagues of color struggling with, which is that there's just a ton of unrecognized and possibly not even named service that you're doing to, you know, in the classroom with students, with student organizations, trying to get things started. I mean, now we're, we're trying to get even basic services for LGBTQ youth, Q youth in Atlantic County. And we know that as, as Stockton faculty, some of whom come from other places, we may be the only people able to advocate for that effectively. And so that's, you know, we take that responsibility seriously, but recognizing that service and being able to generate, you know, the terminology to have the conversation <laughs> and make that conversation more haveable in this space is really important. And related to that, the other thing on my mind is that, um, you know, our current political reality at the nation state level, um, I think makes it in our face undeniable now that there's a lot of a double speak. And so similarly, you know, to I think the issues we're going to talk about in Dr. Allison's uh, session this afternoon about, well, we have awards, we have diversity committee this, and multicultural initiative that. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that those labels are matched with activity or representation or participation or democratic involvement in the institution, right? Yeah. And yeah, and you know, I, I can't not say this, but at Stockton we have a center for women and LGBTQ students and trans students that does not actually exist but on paper it exists and we're getting credit for it and we're probably gonna get an award for it soon. You know, if, <laughs> I mean, I, I, we shouldn't, but uh, I think we really have to um, be, you know, we have to have accountability for, for claiming to have a center and claiming to be providing services that literally do not exist and staff that don't, <laughs> don't exist to, wow. to meet those needs. And you can't just say, well, we have that now because we named something and we have a line of some sort, right? Yeah, um, in a couch in someone's office, right? That is not a center, that is not effective support of students, let alone staff and faculty who really are not visible in any yeah. meaningful way. Um, and um, again, 
you know, I, I, I always feel really torn about the safe space initiatives because, you know, we are not living in safe space, people. We are not living in safe space for people of color. We are not living in safe space for queer kids or queer students or faculty or staff right now. And so, if you've, you know, because you've attended a, a two-hour training does not mean that you've confronted your heteronormative, you know, <laughs> environment that you've absorbed over your lifetime, whether you're queer or not, right? right. Um, so, uh, I just think we need to be careful of just waving the rainbow flag, putting the sticker on your door, and then we're done. Yeah. Right? You know, I have to say, I've been at Penn State for 10 years now, and Penn State, very, very, very white, very, very, very white male. I mean, our, our administrator page. But we, we got a diversity award <laughs> for many years and bragged about it. So, it, hey, I mean, you have a center that's not a center, at least you're not saying you got an award-winning center when it doesn't exist. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it happens in other places too. Oh my gosh. So yes, you're not alone, but keep pushing for sure. So I just wanted to bring up that there is a flip side to the family-friendly issues that we've been discussing. So there are women who come from non-traditional families, and um, whether that be because of sexuality, age, or just your personal choice. But my point is that um, often in the workplace, your work is discredited by other women and men because you're not a wife or a mother and you don't have to balance um, work and apparently you don't have a life outside of work. So there are struggles that come with that. Um, it's challenging to be a young woman, female, um, young woman leader without a family and then justifying time off. Um, and then you're often expected to be the one to work late, work weekends, because apparently you don't have a life outside of work. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to shed some light on that. Thank you. Thanks. I've been told cats don't count. <laughs> So, um, so I, I'm, it's been just such a wonderful morning listening to everyone, and it's exciting for me that we've got staff and faculty and administrators all in the same room, and we're taking an opportunity to listen, um, because it's, it's, we all have a story, and it's easy to judge people, like judging, well, you're a young single woman, so your life is easier than mine because I, or whatever. And um, in our work, um, sometimes what so many of us have had to go through to get to wherever we are, it, um, it has not been easy or safe to share our stories and to have what we really need is we need a place where we can share and we can learn because we're human and um, it's the way that we can grow and, and how we can affect change because if I don't know what you're dealing with then I don't know if what, how I think I can help you is even is even helpful and not hurtful. So, um, if we can have more kinds of moments like these, I think um, we can all get stronger together. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful wrap up. Too. <laughs> a nice ending point okay. for sure. We have, we have one, one more, more microphone out. Okay. okay. Um, so, very briefly, um, first to the point about uh, family friendly. That is an excellent point to bring up, and um, that's why on, I was on the module task force, and one of the things that I know that a number of us said was to get away from language that said family-friendly and say life-friendly, because maybe you have elder care, too, right? I mean, that's another thing that comes up, right? So, so um, I, I think when we talk about work-life balance, we often couch it in that family sort of terminology, but um, I strongly agree. We need to talk about it more to be inclusive with everybody. So it's a very good point. Um, and just lastly, um, for male allies, what is it that you, what are things that we want to know? What are things that are effective that we can do? Thank you. Well, Nikki opened up the morning by um, being a great communicator. That's what she does, that's what she teaches, and she encourages all of us to listen and talk to one another. What we've been trying to explore, in addition to the things we're calling out, that we, things we don't like when we see them, are how can we make that better? What can we do together? What can we do to continue growing or moving forward in the directions that we want to see? 
So I'm going to go to full professor Deb Gussman and say, I really like when you took that brave privilege that you have, that power, and you bottled it up and said, I'll say. <laughs> I like that. But I'm going to ask you to change the object of that verb. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's, right. <laughs> it's the idea that you've just heard that you don't like. It's yeah. the vacuousness of a center that's not a center that you don't like. It's not the person or the agent. So, <laughs> and on that note, we wish you all a wonderful afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>